Hello, everyone. I'm Nathan Nubro, the CEO of the Colorado Springs Philharmonic, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Alexander Sidkovetsky, who appears with the Colorado Springs Philharmonic very soon. Alexander, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. Now, Alexander, you're joining us from Zurich. You're from the UK uh, and originally from Moscow. I, I wonder if you can, if you could, by way of introducing yourself, talk to us about your musical family, because it is extensive. It is, and I and I guess I had no other choice but to play music, um, because uh, that that's right. I mean, um, probably many of your uh, subscribers and many of your listeners have uh, probably heard the name Sitkovetsky in the past. Uh, probably mostly affiliated with Dmitry Sitkovetsky, who is my well, he's sec he's technically my second cousin once removed, but I just like to call him uncle because it's just the easiest it's the easiest thing. Um, but he's a so he's a wonderful violinist and a conductor, arranger, festival director. Uh, he was now um, also chief conductor of the Greensboro Symphony for the last twenty years. Um, and but his mother is also uh, she's now retired, but is a world class pianist, Bela Davidovich who maybe many of you have, have heard, she, she's been living in the United States since the late 70s. And really, since she arrived until her retirement, she more or less had a subscription concert every year, either at uh, the um, at, either at Carnegie Hall or at Avery Fisher Hall. So what well, now it's the David Geffen Hall, I think, but, but right. it used to be Avery Fisher Hall. Um, so she, she's a wonderful pianist and one of the first ever uh, first prize winners of the Chopin piano competition going back to the 40s. Um, I think she might have won the first prize in the second competition ever, uh, right after the Second World War. So, 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 and then her husband and Dimitri's father was one of the great Soviet violinists. Um, his name was Julian Sitkovetsky, and there there is not many recordings of him, but there are some. Um, he was the same generation of, as people like David Oistrakh and Leonid Kogan. Unfortunately, he died of cancer when he was thirty-two years old, before really the world. Knew, knew about him, but but within Russia, he's considered a very legendary uh, yeah. musical figure. And then I have other musicians in my family. My my mother is a wonderful uh, pianist who um, who worked at the Moscow Conservatory as a collaborative pianist, and, and we moved to London together. And uh, my father was the great black sheep of the family. He decided to become a rock star, so he learned the guitar, and he was in a very successful rock band in the eighties. He didn't like the violin at all. Um, and uh, he was in a very successful rock band in the 80s called Autograph, uh, who were a big, big... Is that right? Biggest, yeah, they were probably the biggest, second biggest Soviet band uh, in the 80s. So, so yeah. yeah, very, very musical family. And that's, I also have a, a grandfather who was a director of one of the biggest Moscow orchestras um, in the 70s and 80s. So it's a, it's a, it's a very musical family. So um, once my mom decided that I'm, I should have violin lessons, yeah. I think there was no yeah. other choice. The, no, no other choice for you. And and aren't we lucky that you that you said yes to that to that choice? Let's see. Let's see. Let's let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with a family legacy like that, it makes me think that, and especially with the uh, with you, know, you mentioned Soviet connection with with you know those days back then, you're coming to to perform with Shostakovich, and I would think that it's probably not. It's not unlikely that that someone in your family actually crossed paths or knew Shostakovich. I'm pretty Possible? certain that my grandfather and then uh, Julian, who, who is my gra uh, my grandfather's brother, um, I'm pretty sure that the two of them would have definitely come come across him. And to be honest, um, probably, I mean, I even if not directly, but indirectly, that would be many many links. Not not yeah. just from my family yeah. members, but from, from teachers in Russia, from from not even only in Russia, but maybe from from uh, musicians who had studied in Russia when they were younger, but then had immigrated uh, to the West. Um, I think there's. It was a very you know, let's let's we don't need to say anything positive about communism, but what I would say is that um, the arts were an integral part of the communist propaganda machine, but yeah. that enabled. Um, musicians and artists to be um, to be very well supported. Of course, as long as they told the party line, then we all know about Shostakovich That's and right. about That's his right. kind of quiet rebellion and and fighting the system through his through his music. 
Um, but I think that there was this real society of, of artists who all were in it together, who, who spent time together. Um, you know, mem also, uh, if, you, if you're talking about Shostakovich, you can't not bring the Borodin Quartet into it. And so, for, for example, I know one of the members uh, of the Borodin Quartet and then the quartet I know had worked with Shostakovich on certain repertoire. Not everything, because there was also another quartet in, in Russia at the time called the Beethoven Quartet, which Shostakovich actually wrote his most of his string quartets for. But then the Bordens came along and were also incredible. So yeah, it's it's all very, very connected, to be honest. So many interlinks, so many interlinks. And Absolutely. so I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this. Let's get right into the Shostakovich first concerto. And it strikes me that some, some people in our audience may not be familiar with the with the first concerto, but it it came along, if I'm not mistaken, right after the Second World War, mm. right? I, mean, I think I'm right about this. But then Shostakovich was was denounced, and then it never it was never premiered until the mid fifties. I think that, that's correct. And yeah. I mean, for for me, the most interesting th as a violinist, the the interesting thing is that is how he worked with David Oystra, because David Oystra gave the first, uh, gave the, the world premiere of the piece and it was written for David Oystra. And for me, it was always very interesting how closely Shostakovich collaborated with, you know, with, with, with the great artists of that time. Yeah. And in this case, uh, David Oystra, and I know this is a, a small anecdote, but um, for people who might be, uh, who might know the work, um, you might know that there, at the end of the third movement, there is a huge cadenza a very big cadenza for solo violin, which probably lasts over five, six minutes. And, and it's an incredibly, it's, 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 it's a piercing kind of never, kind of never ending buildup. It starts very, very soft. The, the, the third movement kind of ends in an absolute hush. And then from this hush starts this cadenza, which, which starts from nothing and then slowly and slowly and slowly builds and builds and builds. And it requires, I mean, the whole concerto requires a lot of stamina, but this cadenza just by itself requires a huge amount of stamina to really deliver it from its nothingness at the beginning to this out, outright screaming and shouting and, and crying and wailing and... Uh, the 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 the, pol the police coming to break the doors down. I mean, there's there's so so much in there. Uh, and originally, Shostakovich wrote this cadenza and then went straight into the fourth movement, and uh, with the violin continuing to play. And Oystra told uh, Shostakovich, he said, "You know, Maestro, I'm, I'm I'm very sorry, but after you write such a powerful cadenza, you know, I need a break. I can't just continue into the fourth movement. So that's why." Uh, there's an uh, there's after the cadenza then there's like an there's an orchestral introduction of the fourth movement before the violin comes back in. So yeah. originally the violin just continued to play, but Oyster said, "No, no, no, it's too much. I need I need a little rest." So you can after that. exactly you can your brow. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, but it's an incredibly well, it's it's an incredibly powerful piece. I think it's very interesting. I think Shostakovich was also just an incredible composer of of he also knew what worked i i think that that is also you know as a as a composer he knew how to write incredibly effective music as well i mean this this music it's so it goes right for the heart and i think a lot of it is his emotion but a lot of it is also just his skill as a, as a composer to deliver something which is so so powerful and i i do think that it's a very unique piece i i think that it's not, um, you, you can't really compare it with any other uh, violin concerto. I think it, it really has its own, own place. And uh, I enjoy performing it very much. It's, it's, it's always a journey. It's always, it's, it's not easy for the soul, but, but to come out on the other side, it's, it's, um, it's a great journey. Absolutely, yeah. In the first movement, for, I, when I when I first approached the piece as a listener, the first movement always puzzled me because it just seems it seems like it's it comes from a place of mystery or some, something suppressed, something almost not being said. Well, I think to me, it's it's to be honest, it's it's not even mystery; it's more misery. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that I think that the first the first movement is this. It's it's a very bleak landscape. Yeah. 
and then I think within that bleak landscape, there there is perhaps a singular character. I I, I think that the whole piece is 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 really a story, or at least I have a story which is in 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 my head when 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 I approach the piece. But I th I think that this first movement is is something which very very bleak. It doesn't reveal too much. Um, the orchestra never really reaches a very high dynamic, and uh, it which allows the violin to to never have to shout unless it's necessary and and i think it's uh, the the difficulty of this movement is to get the listener to be involved with you for this i think it's a 12 13 minute movement to to take them with you so that they can't stop listening to you even though one could argue that not much is happening there there, there are some developments but then it he he doesn't allow it to develop fully then he retreats again, and then in the middle there's this absolute kind of ethereal. The violin has to go very, very high, just shimmering silver, silver cloud somewhere. But but it's 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 very very dark this first movement, and then some, and then from the second movement, I think things become a little bit more real. If if one would say that the first movement is is perhaps not yet on our earth, but somewhere else, somewhere I, either below in purgatory or something, or above. So somewhere where where it's not it's you can't touch it, and then this from the second movement on it becomes very earthy, yeah. and um, and then it's and it's a completely different kind of it, yeah it's a, it's a different kind of music but this this incredible sarcastic, almost like a war battle. Uh, I sometimes think of a battle like uh, yeah. during the war for for the second movement, and then and then the third is a lament. I think it's it's obviously the emotional heart of right. of the piece, culminating in it's a pazzacalia, which you know it means it's a it's a recurring baseline, on top of which melodies and and themes are developed, and I think this pazzacalia, this this relentless, um, incessant kind of just just overwhelming you with with emotion more and more and more culminating then in this massive cadenza, probably one of the longest cadenzas in all of the violin concertos. The only one I can think of maybe is as long as maybe the Elgar violin concerto. Uh, and that's a, almost a one hour long work. So, so it's, it, it's, it's a really, it's a big cadenza. And then the last movement is actually very short. It's amazing. It doesn't feel like it because the whole piece is, is long, but the last movement is only maybe four or five minutes. And it's, it seems to maybe it's a, it's a burlesque. It's, 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 somehow like a like a, a celebration of the devil it's 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 finally you know, all inhibitions are gone and and it's all released and it's like a party but but not the kind of party that i would maybe want to go to <laughs> well thank you for thank you for that and we're we're so so delighted that you're coming and we can't wait to introduce you to our audience for your Colorado Springs premiere, uh, but uh, or debut. But I, I want to ask you, if you don't mind, saying just a word or two about your fiddle. Yes. Uh, well, I'm happy to talk about my fiddle because I love playing it. Uh, yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. I, I'm very fortunate because um, this has happened quite recently. It's, it happened over the last three years or so. Uh, but but uh, I'm playing on a wonderful. Uh, violin by Antonio Stradivari, uh, but it's a uh, I I like it even more in some ways because it's a very very early model. So it's yeah. it's we all we all think about Stradivari. We think about his kind of golden period, which were in the early 1700s, and this violin is actually from 1679, which is a really early example. So he was born in 1644. So the I mean I'd, I'd be very happy to talk about this. If there's a preconcert talk or something, when 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 there, when, when there I come, is, we'll, we'll do that. right? Uh, and I can I can show the violin also to, to to everybody then. But but it's the shape of it, the way that it's constructed. You can definitely see a huge influence of his mentor, which was Amati, and um, and kind of Amati probably is considered the godfather of the the modern violin. Um, the, the kind of the way that the violins got developed with Stradivaris and Del, uh, Guarneri del Jesus and, and other members of the Guarneri family, Guaraninis, all, all of that. Um, Amati was probably the one that really established that pattern, uh, that, that way of making the, the violins. And, uh, and in this case, you can really tell with, with this Stradivari violin that, that 
there is definitely a lot of influence still from Amati. It's a little bit smaller, just a touch. It's a tiny bit smaller, a little bit narrower, but I think it's really beautiful. It, 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 I, I think it's a very interesting sound. It's also a sound that seems that we suit each other. And uh, I'm very grateful for it. It's obviously, um, it's not something that a musician unfortunately can attain on their own these days. Uh, you know, that, when I talked to actually to my uncle Dimitri, uh, you know, he was able to buy his Stradivari in the 80s and, and times have changed very, very much. So, so, you know, it's very difficult these days for musicians to acquire um, string players, especially to acquire these kinds of um, instruments. So um, if you ever wanted to support young artists or young musicians and you and, and you want to it's a great investment also it's a fantastic it's a fantastic way of 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 doing something incredible for the arts and because these also these instruments they need to be played it's it's very important that they play they're played and they're not stuck in a museum or in somebody's attic uh because that's how they develop and that's how how they reach the uh, reach their full full potential so uh, yeah I'm, I'm very very fortunate and uh, i'll be happy to show the violin to you when i when i come so investment advice if you want to help a musician uh, very minimal, very buy minimal. a really great <laughs> violin and loan it out <laughs> well apparently since the second world war uh instruments and fine works of art the two constants that have been actually no from the turn of the 20th century yeah. So throughout the wars, throughout everything, um, those two uh, those two commodities have been consistently going up. Yeah. Can I tell one more story about Please. about instruments? It's because um, also it connects a little bit to um, Yehudi Menuhin, who was a big inspiration to me, and 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 actually was the person that took me out of Russia when I was when I was seven years old, uh, because I, I ended up studying at his school uh, just outside of London. Uh, so apparently Yehudi Menuhin was even with Yasha Heifetz around in the 30s, Yehudi Menuhin was the um, probably highest paid violinist on the circuit. And he commanded a fee of about $5,000 in 1935 yeah. or in the 1930s, which, which probably was a huge, colossal amount. Of course. But back then, you could buy a Stradivari violin for $5,000. So he could literally have bought a Strad after every concert. And I, I think that that's just that's that's crazy to 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 us. Impossible in, to in, imagine that in in this generation where where we all dream of these instruments and and in some cases, you know the the ball breaks in the right direction and and you end up with one. But um, yeah. it's it's yeah. it's incredible how actually for some somehow these 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 I mean they are really our works of art and and I think they're incredible incredible living pieces of wood. I think it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing things, but it's amazing how much they have um, risen just in the last 100 years. Crazy. Well, living piece of wood, but it, it must be played by a living musician and it yes. has to be paired Absolutely. with the right musician. So it's not just well, like, about the, the instrument, it's about the pairing with the right music. Right. Yeah. Well, like all living things, living things want to be around each other, uh, want to be around other living things. Yeah, if a, if a living thing is isolated only by itself, then it it doesn't feel so alive anymore. I think it needs the interaction. Well, Alexander, we we can't wait to interact with you. Uh, thank you. I'm really looking soon. forward to coming. I'm really excited. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Alexander, for spending the time with us. We'll see you here in Colorado Springs very soon. Thanks. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye.